The test is in four part, part one, part two, part three, and part four. Now look at part one. Part one. You will hear a telephone conversation about a car insurance claim. You have 30 seconds to look at questions 1 to 5. Good afternoon. What are insurance? This is Janet speaking. How may I help you? Yes, hello. Um, I would like to make a claim on my car insurance, please. Certainly, sir. First of all, I'd like to inform you that all of our calls are recorded for monitoring and training purposes. Is that OK? That's OK. Could you please tell me your full name? Sure. It's Mr Bennett Fisher. OK. Sorry, how do you spell your surname? It's spelled F I S. C-H-E-R. Great. Thank you. I see that you have taken out a third-party fire and theft premium with us on a 2013 light blue Volkswagen Passat. Is that OK? Uh, yes. Well, almost. Uh, the colour is not light blue. It's light green. OK. Thank you for updating your information with us. What is the nature of your claim with us today? Last weekend, I had driven up to York on business and left my car in a monitored car park. However, it was only monitored until 8pm and I did not return to collect it until 9.30pm, after which no car park staff were present. When I arrived at the car park, my car wasn't there. It must have been stolen. I see. Were there any valuable items left in your car which could have been seen from outside? Well, I had recently bought quite an expensive radio for my car, but the front panel is detachable and I always stow it in my glove compartment. So, no, there wouldn't have been anything valuable on display. OK, Mr Fisher. Thank you for that information. I'm going to send you some forms through the mail for you to fill in. Before I can do that, I need to ask you a couple more questions. Is that OK? Of course. You now have 30 seconds to look at questions 6 to 10. Thanks, Mr Fisher. First of all, could you let me know your policy number, please? Of course. I have it right here. It's G34C245. G34C245. Thanks. And the type of claim? Shall we say stolen car? Yes, the car was definitely stolen. I reported it to the police immediately. Uh, I actually have the report number here, if that's of any use. No, not right now. But keep hold of that, as we will need to see a copy of the police report eventually. Which police station did you report the offence at? York Police Station. Was it your first time in York? No, but it was the first time I'd driven there. Uh, I usually take the train. Were you aware that the car park was only manned until 8pm? No, I, I was not aware of that. Were there any signs put up on the premises that informed car owners of the risks of leaving their cars after normal operating hours? Yes, but they said the car park was going to be guarded until 10pm, at which point the entrance is barred so no cars can come in or out. Was any reason given for that sudden change? The police informed me that the staff on duty that night had left on an urgent call. I believe it was something about a family member being admitted to hospital. Were there any personal items left in your car? Yes. First of all, there was the car radio I mentioned before. Ah, oh, yes, of course. Anything else? 
Just some CDs and an old jacket. Right. Thank you, Mr. Fisher. I have everything I need for now, and will send these forms out to you shortly. When you get them, please fill them out with as much information as you can, and where possible, include copies of any relevant documents to support your claim, such as police reports and registration details. Once you have returned that to us, we can then start to assess whether you will be eligible to receive compensation. Do you have any further questions for me today? No, that's all.、Uh, thanks for your help. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a talk about the history of a poetry award. You have thirty seconds to look at questions eleven to fifteen. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this year's award ceremony for the Antonia Watson Memorial Poetry Award. As with previous years, the competition has been particularly fierce, and we received numerous excellent entries. So it's an incredible achievement for our three finalists who are sitting here amongst you, and we should congratulate them all. However, as with every competition, there can unfortunately only be one winner, and we will be announcing them shortly. Before we do, though, a few words about the award itself. As most of you know, the Antonia Watson Memorial Poetry Award has been presented annually since 2010, and was presented biannually for two more competitions prior: once in 2008 and once in 2006. It is entirely funded by Antonia Watson's very generous parents, who offer £1,500 to the author of the best poem on a topic announced at each. Previous award ceremony, as well as five hundred pounds to the first runner-up and two hundred and fifty pounds to the second, bringing the total up to two thousand two hundred and fifty pounds. Now, a few words on Antonia Watson herself, without whom none of us would be standing here today. I briefly knew Antonia while at university, where we were flatmates for a year, and I'm afraid that any speech I give will not be able to do her justice, as she was the kindest, sweetest person I've ever met. Thankfully, this part of my speech was written with the assistance of one of her siblings, Thomas Watson, who was not only her brother but also her best friend. Antonia was born in Slayford, Lincolnshire, in December 1986. From a very young age, she displayed an inquisitive and creative nature, matched in volume only by the gentle kindness of her spirit. She wrote her first poem, named "Love Barks," about the death of her dog at the age of ten. This was also her first poem to be published at her school's newspaper, just two months after another of her poems, "Be Kind," won the 1996 Triad Children's Writing Competition and was published in the competition's anthology. While her early forays into poetry were crowned with impressive success, Antonia unfortunately ceased to write for a few years following the death of her very dear grandfather, Peter William Watson, in 1999. You now have 30 seconds to look at questions 16 to 20.
While her early forays into poetry were crowned with impressive success, Antonia unfortunately ceased to write for a few years following the death of her very dear grandfather, Peter William Watson, in 1999. Despite her writer's block, however, her artistic nature didn't lie dormant during the next four years. She had an active role in various theatre plays, and she also ventured into painting. A few of the plays are available on the internet and you can find several of her self-portraits on our website and you can see for yourself how impressive they are. But poetry, of course, remained her passion even then, which is why in 2003 she resumed writing and her next poem, The War on Both Sides, was published in her college's journal. At the age of 18, Antonia moved to Sheffield to study English literature at the University of Sheffield. This is where she and I met, spending a whole year in adjacent rooms in a flat in central Sheffield. This is also where I met her good-natured, generous parents, Mr and Mrs Watson, who came to visit her regularly and always treated me like a daughter as well. Antonia and I grew very close during that period, and while we ran in different circles, we always found time for each other every week. Antonia self-published one collection of poems in August 2005. It was named Burning Stars, after the poem on page 16, which is also the date of her birthday. It was an immediate success amongst her peers at the University of Sheffield, and it was so cherished by her English literature classmates specifically that it had attracted the attention of one of her lecturers, who put her in touch with a literary agent. She had been due to begin working on her second collection right before her tragic passing in a car accident just five days before her 19th birthday in December 2005. Antonia was always interested in societal shifts and how they affect humanity as well as the environment, and this award was designed to reflect her faith that regardless of what we do, we are all inherently good. With this in mind, all of the topics this competition has dealt with have been about the potential and the positive side of humanity, such as this year's Young Love theme or last year's Inner Power theme. We've had poems about personal strength, about immigration, about gender equality and peaceful protest. And hopefully in 12 months, the poems we'll be awarding will be just as inspiring with the topic of poverty. I know Antonia would be really proud of what her parents and what all of you together have achieved. So, finally, let's get on with the actual award. As I said before, it's been a fierce competition this year, and with more than 5,000 entries, it was quite the task for our three judges to cut them down to just three. But our three finalists definitely deserve to be here, and without further ado, I would like to... That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a conversation between two students who will discuss a project they're working on together. You have 30 seconds to look at questions 21 to 27.
Hey Jess, glad you could make it. We've got a lot to discuss. Hi Matt. Yes, sorry I'm a bit late. I did bring all my notes with me. Yes, me too. Where shall we start? Well, I think it would be a good idea to clarify our objectives just one more time. Yes, good idea. Okay, here we are. We need to record, photograph, and identify the plant species in ten one square meter plots. Does it say anything about where these plots should be and how they should be laid out? Ah, here it is. It says that all the plots need to be no more than ten meters apart. And how do we choose them? Ah, this is the fun part. I remember this. Here we are. Make a one meter square frame using bamboo sticks available from the department stores. Yes, we've we've already done that. I know. I'm just reading the whole section. Okay. One person stands roughly in the middle of the chosen area and throws the frame. The other person uses a tape to mark out the square where the frame landed and returns frame to thrower. The thrower then turns a few degrees on the spot and throws again. The thrower must turn slightly after each throw and vary the force of the throw until after the tenth throw they are pointing in almost the same direction as the first. That sounds a bit complicated. That's only because it's all in writing. It's just a simple throw, turn, throw, turn, throw, turn until we have ten squares. And I guess you want to do the throwing. Well, if you don't mind, I'm sure you'll be more accurate at marking the squares. Yes, I am sure I am, and I'm sure you've got a stronger throwing arm. You now have thirty seconds to look at questions twenty-eight to thirty. Okay, good. We've got that sorted. Now we need to decide where to go. Yes, I've been thinking about that, and I've brought the map. Ah, well done. I forgot mine. Now I've identified three possible locations, but they've all got some disadvantages. Okay, fire away. Well, the area around this lowland marsh could be interesting. There'll be a lot of interesting water plants here. Looks good, but what's the problem? Mainly that it's already a designated nature reserve, and I think there's already been a lot of research done here. Ah, I see. Well, I'd rather do something that's new and can be useful. I agree. That's why I identified this area further west. See here, behind the beach. Oh yes, I see that area there, where it's flat but quite high. Exactly. If you look a bit further inland, you'll see that there are hills which will protect that area from strong north winds. I see. Excellent. But what's the problem? Just that it may not be very interesting. We know that the geology there is not conducive to a wide variety of plants. Hmm. I agree. So, what's your last idea? Well, I think this one is a bit of a winner. Although I did want to show you the other two. Look up here on the north coast. Where? See this bay. Well, I know that there's been quite a lot of studies done here, but a bit further to the east, behind this headland, no one has ever looked at that. Well, I certainly couldn't see any studies. That is interesting, and the plant life could be a bit different because of the shelter from the wind the headland provides. Exactly. Brilliant, Jessica. That's a great idea. We'll go there. Thanks. Now all we have to decide is when is a good time. Well. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part 4. Part 4. You'll hear a talk given by a foreign correspondent. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Good evening. As I assume most of you are already aware, I have been asked to come here and talk to you, essentially give you a quick overview of the life of a foreign correspondent, along with a few tips on how to become a successful international reporter yourself, should this be a career choice you elect to pursue. So let me start by this. Don't. Don't become a foreign correspondent, at least not due to the romantic notions that come attached to this job or what you've seen in the movies. Being a foreign correspondent does not mean exotic adventures. It doesn't mean finding yourself at the heart of the action and putting yourself in danger to inform the world. Let me just tell you this. 80 journalists are killed each year in the line of duty. Many more find themselves in prison or are attacked. You need to think hard. Is this the sort of career I want? Is this the kind of reporting I'm interested in? And only after you've carefully considered all the pros and cons should you decide. But let's focus on those of you who believe that, yes, you've got what it takes to be a foreign correspondent, and this is definitely why you decided to study journalism here. You're all third-year students, which means I don't need to waste my time telling you the basics. Of course, you need to read a lot. Books, novels, newspapers, blogs. And of course, you need to be acceptably proficient in various media skills. But what is it that's going to separate you from normal journalists and reporters? There are four things that'll make you different. The first thing is your experience of the world. You can't call yourself an international reporter unless you've been around and seen different places and different cultures. Seize every opportunity to visit other countries, meet people from around the world. It doesn't matter if it's business or leisure, just hop onto a plane and go everywhere. This will expand your horizons and sharpen your mind, something that, as a foreign correspondent, will help you understand better the culture of the country you'll be covering. And speaking of culture, this is a term you need to make sure you fully understand. What's culture? What makes a country's culture? Explore the culture of the country you're interested in. The music, the literature, the religion. Are there any cultural practices or conflicts you need to be aware of? Are there any tensions within the country? Why? The most important element of culture, of course, is the language. Do yourself a favour, whether you're planning to become a foreign correspondent or not. Learn a foreign language. So many of us are culpable for just sticking to just English. And while English is a very important language in the world, it would be foolish to think it's the only one. Pick a language whose sound you enjoy, a language you find interesting. Trust me, your future CV will thank you for it. And finally, history. Don't expect to be given a job as a foreign correspondent if you don't know anything about your target country's history. No piece of news is disconnected from the past. The whole world tells a story, and your coverage will suffer if you attempt to arrive in the middle with no reference to or understanding of what came before. The hows and whys always lurk in the past. Seek them. The world of international journalism is changing, like every other industry, due to the internet. The arrival of globalisation brought with it a whole new set of rules, and you'll do well to comprehend what they mean for you. 
Unfortunately, gone are the days when a newspaper would hire you and deploy you to a country. Increasingly, newspapers around the world are beginning to favour freelance journalism, offering opportunities to local reporters with the necessary chutzpah and an understanding of the zeitgeist in their region. What this means for you is that you won't just have to start at the bottom. If you want to sustain yourself as an international reporter, you'll also have to pursue many different avenues at once. You'll need to persevere and push and build contacts everywhere. An old student of mine, a terrible student at university, but an incredibly intelligent woman, she came to find me at a conference that was recently held in Yemen, where I delivered a speech on the future of journalism. She was working for three different newspapers as a freelance foreign correspondent, one of them The Times, and she told me that the one piece of advice I gave her that stayed with her and helped her with her career was this. Don't be afraid to fail. It will happen over and over again. It's how you deal with it that matters most. So keep this with you, this one piece of advice. Oh, and don't forget, your passports need to be kept current at all times. Thank you very much for listening. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.